never gonna bring me down This feeling got me flying high as a bird I may never touch the ground I just want to celebrate Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. All of you who are with us online, we're so grateful that you're here. Thank you for worshiping the Lord with us today. And for everyone on all of our campuses that are in person, yay, God for you. We're so grateful that you are a part of our service today and welcome to all of you. Two weeks ago, my wife's father got ill desperately, just out of nowhere. And 10 days ago, he passed away, he went to heaven. Uh, there was nothing that got us ready for that because it just suddenly appeared, it suddenly happened. Five months ago, Kathy's mom passed away and there was nothing that got us ready for that either. And so we've been walking through some deep waters as a family over this time. It, this is not different than what has happened in your families. All of us go through these days. All of us have these times in our life and maybe you've been walking through similar waters. It's not easy, is it? It's, it's a struggle. But I wanna thank you so much for your kindness to my family and for all that you have done to be there for us and we're so grateful. I wanna especially say thank you to Xavier Marilyn. He is the a uh, high school pastor at the Sugarland campus, and he came through for me in a big way uh, the first Sunday that I had to be gone. And then for Ender Palencia, and he came through last Sunday. These two, uh, Ender is our missions pastor. These two guys are such great preachers and such godly men. They live the life, and I just wanted to say thank you to them. Would you, would you do that with me? There was a truck driver that uh, was just out on the road and he came to a diner and decided, it was lunchtime, decided to stop and have lunch. And he ordered a hamburger and a cup of coffee and a piece of pie. And just as it was arriving to his table, three guys walked into that diner. The three guys on motorcycles and they were big and burly and, and they were bullies. And they walked into that diner and they saw this guy sitting alone and they walked over and they began to harass him. And one of the uh, motorcyclists picked up the truck driver's hamburger and ate it. And another drank his coffee and another one ate his piece of pie. Well, they were all much bigger than him and all three together, there was no way he could do anything about that. And so he simply got up and he walked out of the diner and got into his truck and he drove away. Well, these three guys were having a big time mocking him, and after he left, they, they were still laughing, and they said to the waitress, he's not much of a man, is he? And she said, well, I don't know for sure, but I do know he's not much of a driver. He just drove over three motorcycles that were in the parking lot. <laughs> I wonder how many of you have ever gotten angry before. Would you raise your hand? You've ever gotten angry before? I'm not a bit surprised. I'm seeing all these angry people right here at this worship center right here. And I bet everybody has, because the truth is, I could have just said, how many of you have ever breathed before? And it would have been the same number of people. Of course, all of us have gotten angry. Now, there's two other questions I want to ask, and they're rhetorical, and I'm asking you not to answer these out loud. Okay, I warned you. The second question is, how many of you have ever retaliated with someone that did you wrong? And here's the third question, how many of you 
have ever lost control in your anger. It's the third one that I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the issue of controlling our anger. Well, we live in a time right now, don't we, in this country? It's just crazy. It's, it's absolutely crazy what is going on. I think it's been building for years and years, to be honest with you, but, I, but it sort of the trigger, at least in my mind, sort of the trigger was the pandemic when it hit. So all of a sudden now, anger everywhere. Is it masks or no masks? Is it shutdowns or no shutdowns? Is it vaccines or no vaccines? And now two years later, it's been two years. Just in a couple of weeks, it'll be two years. And now all of us are total professionals on pandemics. We totally have the whole thing figured out and we have our side of it. We are right and the other people are wrong. And it's the way people feel all over the country, no matter what position they're in. And then on top of that, the social issues and the political issues have piled on it. And there is a sense of anger. I think one of the reasons why the anger has built to the level it has, I've mentioned this to you before, is because of the 24-hour news channels because the truth is there is this constant hitting of all of the issues and trying to go their own directions of whichever it is the direction of that news station goes and and trying to prove their points and and it's on and on and the pundits that are on those news stations I mean they are whipping up the anger and the the hatred so much it is absolutely amazing but you got to know that they've got to get you back. And the only way they can get you back is to get you good and angry so you'll come back the next day. And this is how they make money and it's how they make millions, every one of them, millions of dollars to keep us all riled up over the next topic. Social media, 24-hour news stations and all of that it has kept us going and here is the icing on the cake I think and that is it has reached a place in which if you disagree with me or if your group disagrees with my group it just proves you're evil not that you're just wrong not that you just have a difference of opinion that you're evil and you got to be canceled you got to be shut down And that is what is separating this country so deeply. It's unbelievable. There is a psychology professor named Raymond Novako who is from the University of California, Irvine, who said, we're living, in effect, in a big anger incubator. I'd use a different illustration, but he's right. I'd use a different illustration. When I was growing up as a kid, my family had humongous gardens. At least it, would, it, it, it looked like a normal garden back in those days. But, but in these days, it would be humongous. And my mother, boy, she could grow anything. And she was amazing. And we had all these vegetables in the gardens and green beans and black-eyed peas and corn and, and probably no okra. And I knew you knew I was going to mention in the word okra, but then she would can all of that. And we had cans of all that. Now, I don't exactly remember. I was just a little kid. I don't exactly remember exactly how the pressure cooker came into the whole thing, but I know she was using this device called a pressure cooker, and it would build up pressure inside this pressure cooker, and then it would release it through some valve, and it was an amazing thing, and I think that's where we are. I think our country is in, is in a pressure cooker. It's why people are doing the nuttiest, craziest things that wouldn't have done it before. And I gotta tell you, if there's any body that's going to rise up and do good if there's anybody that is going to rise above this surely it's the people of God surely it's Christ followers and so I'm wanting us to be 
leaders in that of rising above and here we are in a passage of scripture in a chapter of the bible first corinthians 13 that is called the love chapter and i'm wanting us to walk through a love challenge of not just our own life and changing and making some changes and differences in our life, but reaching out and caring for others and loving others. Like you've seen all these illustrations on the, on the video before I began to speak of our small groups reaching out to help other people in need. This whole idea of the love challenge in the passage actually begins in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, where God says, now let me show you a different way to live. You don't have to live the way other people in this country are living. You don't have to hate like other people are hating. You have to, don't have to be angry like other people are being angry. I want to show you a different way to live. And then when he gets to the end of chapter 13, he sort of summarizes it in chapter 14, verse 1. Now let love be your greatest goal. Let this become who you are every day of your life. I could have preached through this whole passage in one sermon, but we would have not heard it. No, we're going through nine weeks, and this is the seventh week, taking phrase by phrase. And this morning, we have reached the next goal, the next challenge. And listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It is not self-seeking. All these things we've looked at. But now the new one. Love is not easily angered. Love is not easily angered. Notice he doesn't say love never gets angry. He didn't say it that way. He says love is not easily angered. Anger is a part of our wiring. And there are good times to get angry. But controlling the anger is the key issue in the Bible. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. There's three key words to remember in the whole idea of controlling. It's frequency, it's intensity, and it's duration. So the question is this, how do we change a a habitual reaction of anger into an habitual reaction of peace and control? How do we come to a place of learning how to control our anger? Well, there's six key principles I want to quickly go through each one of them as we walk through this idea that God is calling us out to control our anger. And the very first one is simply this. We control our anger by deciding to control our anger. We have to make the decision that, yes, we can get angry. It's part of life, but we learn how to control it. It's part of our wiring. All of us have times in which we get angry. The Bible even says, be angry and not sin. The Bible says that God gets angry. The Bible says Jesus got angry. But the issue is controlling the anger with frequency, with duration, with intensity. So how do we do that? We got to make a decision that we want to, that I want to control my anger and that I can. Have you ever been angry with someone? Maybe you're having a conversation. Maybe it's not all that pleasant of a conversation. And all of a sudden the telephone rings And it's someone calling you back and you've got to talk to them and you see, I've got to talk to this person. And so here you are in the middle of this discussion, which isn't all that positive. And all of a sudden you've got to answer that phone and you answer the phone and say, hi, how are you doing? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, life is, yeah, we're fine. Everything is wonderful. You know what you just did? You just controlled your anger. You just proved in that moment you can. So what is it that motivates us to control our anger? It's the price tag of our anger. What is our anger costing us? And if the price gets so high, we know we got to bring it down. 
Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22. A hot-tempered person starts fights and gets into all kinds of sins. In other words, you and I can find ourselves in all kinds of mess in our life because of an anger that is out of control. Proverbs 15, verse 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up division, but a patient man calms a quarrel. Proverbs 14, verse 17, those who are short-tempered do foolish things. So many of the dumb things we have done in our life, we have done them in anger. And we know it, and it has cost us a price. It was a few years ago in Parade Magazine that I saw this title, and the title simply is this, Is Anger Killing You? New evidence about the heart shows that reducing the hostility in your life can prolong your life. And the article go, goes on to say that evidence now, scientific evidence now, is that they prolonged anger, uh, too, too high of an intensity, too high of a duration, too, too high of a frequency is actually beginning to break down your heart gets beginning to actually build heart disease of some kind that you are slowly, the article says, slowly killing yourself with anger out of control. Anger out of control ruins marriages, it destroys families over nothing. It ruins relationships and friendships and it actually is slow suicide. It's the price tag of anger. But the truth is, we can get a hold of our anger. We actually do have an ability to control ourselves. So the, the issue is, we've got to come to the place of deciding, I want to control my anger. That's the first principle. The second principle is this. We control our anger by cooling down before we address an issue. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool, notice who it is that does this, a fool gives full vent to anger, but the wise quietly holds it back. I love email. Uh, I, I love the whole inf information flow of email. I love email. I love to be able to, to have it there to go back and refer to it. I love instant message. I love being able to communicate so fast to so many people. But I gotta tell you where email and where instant message and, and all that stuff turns into a negative is when we try to solve emotional issues through that means. Because it usually doesn't turn out that well. I can go back, I, I, it's not always been the case, but it's too frequently been the case for me. In which when I've tried to address problems and issues and I was emotional about them I had to go back and apologize so many times with emails so many times with instant message why because there was no cooling down time and, and that's why we love it so much because boy I can just say what exactly what I'm thinking right now I can give what for right now but right now is not the time because it is in those moments we end up screwing up. And that's why we need to walk away from technology and give ourselves ourself a chance to cool down. It's a, a, a guy, anonymous, I don't know who it was, but it was sure smart. He made this statement. He says, before you begin to give somebody a piece of your mind, consider carefully whether you can spare any. <laughs> Maybe you don't have enough Proverbs 29, verse 11 says, a wise man delays and lets his anger cool down. A wise person delays. So what works for you? Is it counting to 10, counting to 100, counting to 10,000? By the time you got to 10,000, you won't even remember what you were angry about. You'll just be tired of counting, but you won't be angry anymore. How, how high does it have to go? Proverbs 19, verse 11 says, a wise man restrains his anger and overlooks insults. This is to his credit. 
There's three questions that help us with the cool down. Three questions we need to remember as as we're working through this whole cool down thing. The first question is to ask ourselves, why am I angry? Now, well, that's simple. I'm angry because of so-and-so. That's why I'm angry. No, no, I'm asking you to go deeper than that. What is it, what boundary? You see, we all have boundaries in our lives, and oftentimes we can't even articulate what our boundaries are, but we know there's boundaries because the moment someone crosses over the boundary, we know it. That's when we get angry. They just violated my boundary. Which boundary is it? to really step back for a little bit. Why is it that I just, why did I react this way? What was the boundary that I felt like got violated? Or maybe, maybe I haven't been sleeping all that well and I'm just, just tired and now I'm reacting out of my tiredness. To step back and ask the question, why am I reacting this way? What is it that is the trigger? The second question to ask you yourself is this, What do I really want? Is it just that I want to retaliate? Is that what I really want? I just want to retaliate or I just want to defend myself. What is it that I really want? If I really want to make a change in a person's life, if I really want to fix this issue, then I'm not going to be able to fix it through anger. Here's the third question. How can I get what I need by some other means than anger. And here's the point. We can't actually change another person through our anger. Now we can for a few moments. It's a, it's a short-term change. They don't want to be around the anger anymore, so they just quickly change. But it won't change that person. Because as soon as they get away from you, nothing's changed. You and I can't change any other person through external pressure. The only way people are actually changed is through internal pressure. And usually what has to happen is the person has to say, you know what, I don't want to be that kind of person. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to be this kind of person again. It is an inward thing that has to happen for a person to actually change. So what is it inside that person that you could help facilitate a change? It won't be with anger. It'll have to be through another way. What is that other way? There's a third thing that happens. There's a, there's a willingness to be out of the control of anger. It is a willingness to cool myself down before I address the issue. But then there's a third thing, and that is by hearing the other person out with a listening ear, which sounds redundant, but it's really not. Hearing someone out with a listening ear, but the problem is, is that sometimes we hear other people out, but we don't have a listening ear. The whole time that they're talking, we are formulating our counter-argument. And we're not actually hearing what they have to say. And this is part of the reason it just keeps going. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. Because we're not actually open to hear an opinion different than our own. But we need to be. We need to have a listening ear. Listen to what the Bible says in James 1, 19 and, 19 and 20. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life God desires. Your anger isn't going to accomplish anything that would honor God. So here's what he's saying. Here's what I want you to do. Would you be slow to anger? Would you be uh, slow to speak? Would you be quick to listen and actually listen, actually hear what the other person is saying? Long before I ever came to Sugar Creek, I was facing a pretty intense issue. And uh, I I was going to a meeting 
with another person outside of the church I was pastoring. It had nothing to do with family, but it was going to be a very intense meeting. And I was praying about it. I, oh God, how do I, how do I deal with this? How do, how do I handle this moment? And uh, I had actually gone early to that town and I was sitting in a restaurant and I was praying and saying, God, how do I deal with this? And I felt I heard God say in my heart, ask questions. Don't make any statements, ask questions. And in fact, I wrote down then five questions. Ask questions, he said to me, and listen to the answers. I wrote down five questions. And I'm going to tell you, I learned something that day. It was a great day in my life. I learned that when you're about to do something, you're, supposed to, you're about to have an issue that is really difficult. The best way to deal with it is not to make any statements. The best way to deal with it is ask questions and listen to the answers. Then you, it may not change anything you think, but you actually have given an opportunity to hear the other person out. And I did it. And you know what I learned from that? I haven't always applied it. I have applied it many, many times. I haven't always applied it, but I have applied it many times. And I have noticed that it works. I actually hear the other person and what they say. By not making statements, asking questions. So listen to what the Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse four. None of you should think only about his own interests, but consider other people's interests also. And that word consider in the Greek is the word skopos, where we get the word microscope and telescope. Skopos literally means to focus on, to pay attention to, to actually listen to the answers. Can I tell you something? Right now, we are in an environment in our nation in which it's echo chambers. People have retreated to their own echo chambers. And what I mean by that is that people have retreated to only be around people that agree with them. Only listen to other people that reinforce what they think. But not here. A person who thinks differently. You could hear a person who thinks differently. And you may not change your opinion at all. It's okay. You don't have to change your opinion. But you actually listened to a person who had a different perspective. And you actually heard what they had to say. And I'm going to tell you just the act of it. It may not change any of your opinion about the topic. It's okay. It doesn't have to. But you actually heard somebody out. And I'm going to tell you, if we could somehow, some way in this country, learn how to hear each other again. I don't agree with you. I haven't changed my opinion about this. Or maybe I have. Maybe you've opened up some ideas I hadn't considered. Whichever way it turns out. But to actually listen to someone who thinks differently about masks and shutdowns and vaccines and blah, 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 blah. It is amazing what could happen in our work environment, in school, our classes, our families. It's listening. Here's the fourth principle. By now, attacking the issue, not the person. Once you actually have cooled down and, you, and, and, and you've actually heard the other person's viewpoint, maybe you haven't changed your mind at all, but now attack the issue and not the person. It'll change the words we say instead of saying, you are this way, you are that way. It is attacking the issue. Did you know once we start doing that, you know what we'll discover? A whole bunch of those issues are nonsense. And we just need to blow them off and go on. What in the world am I angry about this? Why am I angry about this? 
But some issues truly are issues and you can't ignore them because they'll be like termites in your family and your, in your life and they'll, they'll tear down the foundation of your home. No, you, there's some issues you've got to deal with. The Bible never says to us that we are to forsake truth in order to get along for any reason. We are not to do that. We are to deal with issues, but not blasting each other. Having a good relationship is not always appeasing the other person. You got to deal with things but deal with them right. And listen to how the Bible says to do it in Ephesians 4, 15, by speaking the truth in the spirit of love, we grow up in every way in Christ. Do you want to grow up in every way in Christ? This is how you do it. This is what he says. And then in Ephesians 4, 29, don't use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what's needed. You can address an issue straightforward without tearing down the person in the process. The Bible never says to compromise truth. We are not to compromise truth. But we are to look for ways in which as we deal with an issue that we can meet each other halfway. You can't always do that. But in the areas you can, you can't always do that. But in the areas you can, to find common ground, to be flexible. And this is what he's saying in Romans 12, verse 18. Do everything possible on your part to live at peace with all people. And sometimes you can't. But do everything you can. Psalm 37, 37. The man of peace has a wonderful future ahead of him, a happy ending address the issue with truth but address the person with kindness here's the fifth thing by building our closest relationships with others who know how to control their temper look at what he says in Proverbs 22 24 to 25 don't make friends with a hot tempered Man or woman, do not associate with anyone who is easily angered. Or you may learn his or her ways and get yourself ensnared. Your closest friends need to be people that have got their lives in control. That's what he's saying. Doesn't mean we can't be friends with people who don't have their anger under control, but don't build the closest relationships with them and don't be around them a ton because sooner or later you'll learn to be like them. And this is not Mark Hartman saying this. This is what is right there in Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25. One of the ways that we get our anger under control is being careful about who we spend the most time with. Here is the sixth one by developing spiritual disciplines in our life, by spending time every day with God in his word, by every day spending time in his word. You know what? You can do that in the morning. It's the best time probably to do it is in the morning because that helps get your day started. And maybe it's spending, going through a book of the Bible and reading a little bit every day. Maybe it's reading the Proverbs of the day, meaning, okay, today is the 20th. Today, read Proverbs 20. Tomorrow, 21, and all the, and then every month you're going through the Proverbs again. You're going to be very wise, very smart if you do that. And he's going to address an issue that day that perhaps you just read about and you already got fortified before you faced it. Spending time with God in prayer every day after you read God's word, spend a little time in prayer and pray for yourself, pray for others. Oh God, I want to apply what I just read in my day to day. You're getting me ready and I want, to, I want to do right. Spending time every day in worship of God. Maybe that's reading the Psalms. Maybe that's listening to Christian music, whatever it is. And what happens to us is that we're fortifying our day every day through spiritual disciplines. The challenge of this week is to face the anger moments of our life with more control. 
God, I'm asking you to reduce my anger duration. I'm going to ask you to reduce my anger frequency, and I'm going to ask you to reduce my anger intensity this week. And trust me, you're going to get challenged this afternoon. This afternoon, and then tomorrow, and the next day, God, this week, I want you to change me. I want to take hold of your word. I want you to change me this week. And you know you're going to need a power from God. You need Jesus in your life. And I want to challenge you to give your heart to Christ. Those of you who are listening online, worshiping with us online, have you ever given your heart to Christ? Have you accepted him as your Savior? If you haven't, you can right now. Give your heart to Christ. And then every day, give yourself over to him. You're not getting saved every day. You get saved once. But now every day, you yield yourself to him. Every day of your life. And you're letting God have control of your life. If you'd like to accept Christ as Savior online or any of our campuses, the Next Step Center, indicate to that person who is helping you online and will help you get go to uh, that point of receiving Christ into your heart. What's God saying for you to do today? It's going to take Jesus to get you there. I want to encourage you, when this service is over, go to the Next Step Center, talk to one of our ministers. Open your heart to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. We acknowledge, oh God, we cannot live this way on our own. But oh God, we want to live this way. In control. Facing times of anger, but limiting the duration and the intensity and the frequency. Oh God, I pray you would move in our heart and help us to learn how to turn the script in our family, in our relationships, in our own heart. Move in our heart today, Father. Change us from the inside out, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.